Glad we're getting together with the school board and uh, you know the superintendent and uh, the uh, respective staffs. You know, it's always a good idea to get together, and uh, perhaps we should really try to do this a little bit more on a frequent basis. Uh, that being said, we're ready to go uh, right now. Just to let you know, from our end, uh, Miss Wooten is running a little behind at a meeting. Mr. Rouse will not be here due to a, a previous commitment, and Mr. Bellucci is out of town. And, uh, and Chair Lady Rye, uh, I believe you have a you know a couple to um, announce to. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So Vice Chair Melnick is out of town, and Mrs. Uh, Weems had a prior commitment before official notice of the, this meeting was received, uh, involving an IEP meeting with a special ed student, and those are very difficult to reschedule. So she sends her greetings. Okay. Okay, but once again, uh, I think we're ready to uh, you know proceed. Mr. Mayor, at this time, our um, representative from ODU will come and give our presentation. Okay. I didn't want to risk your last name. <laughs> Welcome, Greg. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Always a pleasure to be here, uh, members of council and the school board. Um, I know Mr. Moss is looking at me saying he's not from ODU <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, with the Planning District Commission. Um, you know, maybe at some point ODU, but not right now. <laughs> Anyways, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, so I know this is five-year forecast, and, and Kevin uh, asked me to kind of kick this off and provide somewhat of a regional perspective and talk about what's going on in the economy and just kind of lay the groundwork. So I'm going to go through a bunch of charts real quick. Please stop me at any point. Um, and, and yeah, we can certainly have a conversation. I'm just going to jump right in. Um, hopefully this works easily. So the national economy, um, what you see there in the blue line is what's called potential GDP. This is something that economists event, invent. Um, to so where we would be going if all things were on track. Uh, the red line is actual GDP. Of course, you can see a couple things in here. First of all, that large dip below the blue line, that was the long, long recession that we had, the Great Recession. Uh, this last little red dip, that's the COVID recession. And so it kind of puts a few things in perspective just with how the economy has been tracking. Traditionally, Hampton Roads has followed the national economy. So what happened at the nation kind of happened in Hampton Roads. This is less true over the last decade. Um, but still, you know, a takeaway here certainly is just the difference in the type of recession we had from the Great Recession to the COVID recession. Um, and you can see how we just popped right back up out of the COVID recession, but we're not back where we were. So we're still 1.7% below where we were um, or where we're kind of expected to be, rather. Um, one of the, the things that's happening right now that's a little bit difficult to understand, um, economists love projecting and they like doing forecasts, and they're really horrible at it, um, but that doesn't prevent them from doing it next time. So these are the headline, the, the, the reason I put this up there, these are the headline payroll numbers. Every, every month we come out and we say, this is what's happening in jobs and employment, the nation, and we also have it regionally. And economists project what the, it's gonna be, and they're wrong. Uh, we really have no idea what's going on right now. And so when Kevin says, can you present the regional economy and the regional picture. One of the first things I said to him is, Kevin, there is no good solid data anywhere. I just got brand new data from the BEA this morning that I know is wrong, completely wrong. And there's really, we're really struggling as analysts and economists to get a hold of what is going on right now because the data is either not there or it's wrong. Um, and then when it does come out, there's huge swings in what the data is saying, which makes it really confusing. 
and that doesn't prevent people from speculating on exactly what they think is going on. Uh, so that is all I really have to say. The rest is just, um, well, my perspective on the economy. But um, the data is tough. The data is making things really, really difficult. The best data you almost have is local data. So it's, it's you know, the money that's coming into the city that's real data. Local data right now is the best. Um, if we look at the, the employment picture, I just want to show to you uh, how things have been a little bit different in Hampton Roads than they have been at the, the state level or the national level. The black line here is the United States, orange is Virginia, and green is Hampton Roads. And you can just, this takes us back to 2005. So if we look at civilian employment, that's the, the employment numbers we get monthly. Essentially, we are right back to where we were when we started in 2005 with respect to civilian employment. We, we grew a little bit, and then we saw the crash in 2007 through 2009. We had the Great Recession. We built back up. We dropped down again, and we're slowly coming back. And one of the things that the takeaway here is Hampton Roads had a much more difficult time building its way out of the Great Recession than the Commonwealth and the nation did. And a large part of that was because of defense spending. We saw cuts in military personnel exacerbated by cuts in contract spending. So we were further behind, and, and now you can see how we've dropped back down and essentially put us right back to where we were in 2005. If we look more recently, um, this is bringing us back to January 2020. This is right before the, the pandemic hit. Um, you can see a couple things here. First of all, uh, Hampton Roads and the Commonwealth kind of were hit less hard than the national economy was by, by COVID. Um, the U.S. Has, has done a little bit better in terms of recouping some of the jobs that they've lost. Hampton Roads remains 5% below pre-COVID, Virginia 4.3%, and the U.S. at 3.3%. But you can also tell that there's been kind of an, an initial resurgence and a leveling out, a plateau. Um, so that's made things a little bit unsure, certainly where we go from here. You know, we've, talked, we've heard of people talking about a K-shaped recession where some people are doing really good and you know, the, the, the haves were doing really well and the have-nots were not doing really well. That really hasn't played out in reality. Um, right now, things are just pretty jumbled and it's not clear exactly who all is benefiting or at least you can't wrap it in a nice bow and simplify it. It's really complex in terms of what is happening right now. If we look just over the past two years um, in terms of employment in Hampton Roads, we can see that who is winning and who is losing by industry. Certainly uh, there's a little bit of diversity. Scientific, scientific and technical, which is really driven by the federal presence in Hampton Roads, <clears throat> they're doing well. Um, you've, you've heard about the $5.8 billion in transportation projects that's going on in Hampton Roads. Uh, transportation is doing well. The port is set in record numbers. The port's doing really well. Construction is doing fantastic in Hampton Roads. Anybody's trying to build something at their house, you know, if you want a contractor, a builder, a plumber, good luck. Um, that's because there's a huge demand for this. Uh, and, and construction and, and the port truckers, um, they're really putting a lot of pressure on the labor force in that respect. Um, but th those, those industries are doing well in Hampton Roads. If we slide down to the bottom end, no big surprise there for Virginia Beach. Um, but leisure hospitality has certainly taken a, a significant hit. In the last year, we've actually done really well. But this is going back two years because if I compare it a year ago, it makes no sense. These numbers are nonsensical. So looking back two years, where have we come? Uh, healthcare, I know a lot of people thought healthcare would be doing really, really well. Um, they took a pretty significant hit with COVID and they're continuing to take that hit and they're having a really difficult time finding employees and their, their whole model is adjusting. Uh, manufacturing, we'd like to see that come back quicker and of course you can see the other industries, how they play out here, but certainly there's a great deal of diversity across industry. Looking at unemployment rates, uh, I've told this before, unemployment rates are pretty much a useless number, but the trend is pretty interesting. Um, so here again, the U.S. is in black and Virginia in orange, Hampton Roads in green. And you can see we all kind of felt the same track. 
And this is, this is U3, this is baseline unemployment. There are six different measures. Um, all of them are following the same track. If we break this down by gender, if we break it down by race, if we break it down by education level, which we can do at the national level, they're all following pretty much the same track. So we jumped up really, really, really high record unemployment rates, and then we dropped. Um, but like I said, the rate itself doesn't really mean a whole lot. Uh, it just says um, who's looking for a job based on what percent is in the labor force. So if we look just at the labor force in Hampton Roads, this goes back to January of 2020. And really what we're looking at here is that that top blue line, that's our labor force. So our labor force uh, is kind of flat, but it's declining um, by 5% if we go all the way back to January. Uh, labor force employment is down 6%, unemployment up 49%. And if, if you're looking at that number and you say, well, unemployment went up 49%, well, that certainly doesn't, that doesn't track well with a you know, relatively low unemployment rate. Essentially, what I'm saying here is the labor force is not healthy right now. It really is not. And there's no short answer on how to fix it because everybody across the US and even globally is wrestling with the problems, what do we do with the labor force? We've seen a significant number of people just drop out of the labor force. And now we're fighting something that where, you, where unemployment goes from cyclical to structural. So we're seeing structural unemployment differences. The jobs are not, that are available aren't the jobs that people who are looking for a job want to fill. And that's a problem all over the place. Um, it is putting pressure, a lot of pressure on wages, but this is not, there's no short-term fix to structural unemployment. And so really what we want to see is for a healthy labor market, we want to see the number of people who are in the labor force, that's the top blue line, we want to see that going up. We want to see some growth there. Um, and we want to see the number of people, of course, that are employed going up as well. A couple of things that are, really, that, that are really strange and that are tied together is, first of all, the, a couple of years ago, the chamber put out a survey and they asked small business, what is one thing that we could work on that would help you guys? Small business responded overwhelmingly, childcare. Now, I, you know, most people, myself included, would have never thought that that would be the number one thing that small businesses would say, we need help with childcare. Right? So you can imagine what happens when schools shut down and we've seen what happened with COVID and parents having to take more responsibility for their kids, uh, childcare closing up, that certainly has impacted our labor force. Another thing is uh, a lot of elderly people that were in the labor force reconsidered how much it was worth their time to be in their labor force, couple that with increasing property values. Uh, they, their property values go up, their nest egg is bigger, they don't need to work as much because they feel more secure, and suddenly we're seeing elderly people drop out of the workforce and we're seeing uh, working parents drop out of the workforce. And uh, again, there's no short-term fix to that. That's kind of our new reality. Population growth across the U.S., um, has certainly been going down. The trajectory is going down. The 2020 census came out. You know, we saw a lot of headlines on this. Um, I just put this in here because this is another factor that plays into the labor force when we talk about growth and certainly have, having the school board here as well. Um, Hampton Roads has, has traditionally grown. Our, our population has grown when military spending went up. Well, we thought that was true. It turns out Hampton Roads population grew only when military personnel went up. It's not the spending that drove population growth. It's actually the military coming and saying, here's a whole bunch of new personnel, and suddenly we saw an influx of population. I don't see that happening again anytime in the near future, uh, where we're going to see a huge influx of personnel. C certainly the, the Department of Defense is kind of changing their strategy, and they have been for some time. Ships have smaller crews and so forth. Um, so that was a population driver for us in the past. It's not going to be in the future. Uh, but when we looked at one of the things that happened with, with COVID is people who were in New York or people who were living in San Francisco suddenly realized, why am I living here if I don't have to? 
And one of the things when I present across the region is, you know, you have a room full of people and they're all complaining about Hampton Roads. You know, we got to fix this, we got to fix that. Everybody I know who lives here loves it here because it's really kind of an amazing place to live. I mean, when I first got my, I came down here from Michigan and my, my boss at the time took me for my, my interview down at the oceanfront and I'm like, wow. <laughs> It, you sold me on the ocean front, but this is a phenomenal place to live. So if we want to attract a population base, then we got to do it in probably different ways than we've, you know, before we've just kind of rode the back of the DOD. Uh, we can attract employment, and some places are, but we got to be creative with how we do it. And the reason I say that, especially with respect to the youth, you know, remember back all the way, I think, in, in third grade or fourth grade when you learn about population histograms and how they're in the shape of a triangle. Ours is not. Um, so we're not bringing in these younger kids um, that, that are attached to families through the military. And that certainly shows here in our population histogram. Um, so that, you know, destiny. Uh, is really driven, driven by demographics. And here's our demographic picture. Um, I'm not going to touch too much on home prices other than to say, you know, home prices was one of the few things, well, I shouldn't say one of the few things, one of the many things that was really unexpected uh, when, when the pandemic hit. You know, it was an odd thing in March of 2020, we were talking to the planning directors, and one of the planning directors spoke up and he said, anybody else seeing a huge increase in permits for pools? Who would have expected that March, April, May, pool permits way up across the region, right? It was really kind of an unexpected, unforeseen thing, and, and suddenly home prices across the nation take off. And Hampton Roads finally got above where we were in 2005, 2006. So home prices shot up, but in order for home prices to continue to surge, you know, you, we can have temporary fluctuations. Um, but in the long term, we need this to be backed up by real money. That means there has to be real income behind it. That means there has to be real jobs for it. So we can see this, these numbers shoot up temporarily. Uh, long term, we call in a question, are we going to continue to see these significant increases in property tax values uh, go up and up? Uh, it's not sustainable. We know that. We just don't know where the top is. And, and clearly, we have guessed wrong across the board. Uh, on when it's going to end, but we know it's just not a sustainable path. Uh, tie that to mortgage rates, which has really helped us to accelerate. We have really low mortgage rates, so people can buy more house, so property values go up. But interest rates, well, uh, interest rates are likely to go up. Probably not this year, but when we're looking into next year, there's that ugly, ugly word, inflation. Um, when interest rates go up, uh, that's going to curb how much we're going to want to pay for housing. And last Friday, everybody heard, you know, 30 year, you get these headline news on inflation, what's going on with inflation. I'll tell you what's going on inflation. Uh, it's really, really complex and it's difficult to understand. Here I'm showing you uh, gasoline up top, car and truck sales, energy, used cars, transportation. Some of that stuff is, I just bought a couch. It was awful. Um, I mean, it really, I was like, what happened to couch prices? But thankfully, our, our puppy ripped our other one up, so we didn't have a choice. Uh, but I also flew to Denver. Uh, I think it was $137 return, um, right? So we're seeing very real changes in prices of things where, where prescription drugs are down and airline fares are down. Um, but we're, we're, the, the, the general inflation picture is pretty scary. And so when you see these headline news items like last Friday that says, you know, record inflation rates over 30 years, it suddenly, suddenly makes some of us think like, well, what was it like, you know, here we're going back to the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I would caution against that. Um, there's a lot of factors that are playing into what's going on in inflation right now. And we're probably looking at something that's more similar to inflation that happened post-World War II than what we're looking at in the 70s, just because the way things are structured. Right now, expectations are, and, and again, these are economists forecasting, so you know they're wrong, you just don't know how wrong. Uh, but right now, expectations are we're going to see inflation continue to climb 
uh, into the middle of next year, and then we're going to start seeing inflation come down. Um, you know, there's supply chain issues which are causing pretty significant interruptions, but the supply chain issues are not consistent, so it's not one single thing you can address. Um, but a lot of the factors that are playing into this right now are really going to take a little bit to get sorted, right? It's going to take some structural realignments before we can, we can bring these back down. The reason I threw this orange line in here, um, so the blue bar is, is just the, the inflation index, and you can see just how in the last little while it, it has curved way up the end there. Uh, the, the orange one is more, that, that's a 12-month moving average, so it kind of um, adjusts for that. You can see how it's popped up. If that number continues to climb, that's certainly worrying. Uh, it will be difficult for, for us to adjust. Um, but you compare that to where we were in the 70s and post -war World War II, and you can see right now it's certainly not the same thing, but certainly worth keeping an eye on. One of the other things that I keep putting in front of us is this the whole nation the, the whole nation notion of federal spending, right? We clearly as a region are dependent on federal spending. Uh, that's that's nothing new. But when we look at where federal spending is going, it is worrying because at some point we're going to have to start paying for all our spending. And some places across the nation, this is not such an issue. But for Hampton Roads, the last time we had sequestration, the last time we said, let's rein in federal spending, we had a decade of no growth. And when we see these charts going up and up, you got to remember at some point we're going to have to rein this in. And so we probably want to start looking for other things other than defense to help grow the economy. I don't want to leave on that depressing note. I just want to touch on a few regional initiatives that are going on. $5.8 billion in regional transportation infrastructure projects. 93% of that is paid for by the residents of Hampton Roads. 7% by the state. There's no federal funding in a lot of this. Um, but we're really building here, and we're, we're working our way out of a whole many years of, of lack of attention that's paid for to some of our infrastructure. That's exciting. I think we're the second highest region in the nation on that. Um, interconnected fiber ring network, we're really doing some good stuff here. I think we're the envy of the state and many other regions in terms of what's happening. And a lot of that was driven actually by Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach started this, initiated a regional effort, so it's fantastic news. Uh, we want to move that to the peninsula and to our more rural regions, so that's pretty exciting. Economic development, sites readiness, we realized people weren't coming here because you know you can't sell from an empty cart. We didn't have any properties available. We're trying to get people to come in and they're like, where do you want us to go? So we're working on getting sites ready for, for businesses to come in. We've restructured economic development and we're implementing that model. And I think that's doing really great things for us, of course. Offshore wind, the supply chain, working really hard to develop that. You know, as a region, we really started pushing this a few years back, and we got together to the state, push this effort, and it's and it's yielding dividends now. Uh, we've got a regional revenue sharing model that's in place, and we've got the peninsula all signed on, Chesapeake signed on to it. Um, but we're looking again for new models for economic development to really make regional investments. And then, of course, there's a lot of federal initiatives going on right now, infrastructure package, uh, EDA regional challenge, which we're trying to bring a lot of money in for that, investments in federal facilities like Jefferson Labs that are really exciting for the region. So anyways, there's a lot of good things that are going on in the region. Uh, we will certainly want to keep an, our eye on the ball, or quite a few balls, as it were, that are going in play right now. Um, but as we move forward, I think we're looking, you know, we've got to keep an eye on local numbers more than these national numbers and even regional numbers because they're going to be bouncing around for, for a year or two yet where we really find our bearing. So that concludes my comments. And uh, Mr. Dehaney, I don't know, do I take questions now or later? I'll tell you, uh, questions now, that would be great. If it's okay, we'll alternate. Okay, any council person has a question at this point, Mr. Moss. I just, I just have uh, two. I know you didn't talk much about M2 money supply very much and how that relates to GDP, so I'd it'd be interested in any comments and thoughts you have on how that relates. And my second question is relative to the governor-elect's proposal to put back $2.6 billion that are currently being collected by the state and returning that back to both small businesses and to 
uh, residents in terms of doubling the standard deduction and waiving certain taxes on businesses, what would be the fiscal implication on your growth projection based on that additional fiscal stimulus that the elect governor-elect has mentioned? So I'll tackle the, the second part first. Really, um, I, haven't, I haven't been able to discern too much. First of all, I don't have a projection in place so because we're really not sure what's going on. But I haven't been able to really discern exactly what would take place at the state level and what would impact. Of, of course, there's, there's, um, there's a few balances there uh, in terms of how localities would make up for lost revenues if, if deductions were put in place and also at the state level. Um, but the, the details there are not really, uh, I haven't seen, I haven't seen the, the details of that plan put in place. Um, so I'd really need to, to, to evaluate the details before I could make an assessment of that. Um, but I would say with respect to revenues that are being pulled in uh, at the state level and the local level, clearly we do have a problem in, the, in this commonwealth with uh, tax modernization. Our tax code is very old and, and it's getting older. And if we don't adjust that tax code, we're going to find ourselves uh, especially our localities are going to be in, in a place where we're kind of, we've got our, our wagon attached to the wrong horse and we need to, to lower the rates and broaden the base and really make this a more fair and equitable tax code. Um, and I can't speak to, with, to respect um, how the governor's initiative would, would play into that. But uh, with respect to M2 money supply, that's the problem with GDP. When we look at GDP, it's a really broad-based measure of growth. Right, so the the federal government can just throw money and throw money and throw money, and that's gonna that's gonna artificially boost gross product, and that's essentially what it has done. So things look great uh, because we're printing money. Typically, that would be offset because the rest of the globe would say, well, if you're gonna print money like that, then well, we're gonna devalue your currency and we're gonna pull back. So so it would be measured, but that hasn't happened. So the traditional economic school of thought, uh, professors are literally rewriting courses now because we're printing money and we're not seeing any negative impacts from it yet. So how does that impact GDP? Well, right now it's been a win-win. We just don't know when it's going to be a lose because uh, we haven't seen any of the warning signs yet that we're in a critical place. My fear is that when we get to that critical place, when we start seeing the warning signs, it'll be too late. Um, so that is one of the fears. I, uh, I expect that we're going to see at the federal level some point uh, reining in the federal expenditures, and that's going to cut into our GDP growth. Um, but that'll be a necessary rebalancing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody from the school board at this point? Any other council member? Greg, you did good. <laughs> oh, sure. One, the demographic one, which you mentioned, which I think, in, in the, even on our write-up, is the most driving aspect of our economy, because it shows with growing age population, they tend to spend less on consumables, and they spend less money on taxable things. So as you look out there at that growth model, if, in fact, the middle is slightly shrinking, but not growing at all, that's basically what I read in your report, but the top is growing significantly, the senior citizen piece. How does that, and maybe you don't know, but I would, it would seem to me that that would have a, be putting a downward pressure on transactional sales, which is a major source of growth income, which is sales tax. So if you're working middle peak earning years or also peak purchasing years, that place is staying stable, but the people not spending money <laughs> is growing where does that factor into your assessment? Well, uh, that's a very astute observation. So one of the things I think that is happening right now that people don't recognize is they're seeing these sales tax numbers grow and grow and grow. And they think things are great, but they're not. The reason sales tax numbers have been growing is really because it's not that we're spending so much more. Uh, we did during COVID, but the expenditures on uh, um, retail isn't that much more, but we've been taxing internet sales in a way that we weren't able to before. So, but that, that trick has been played now. Uh, we're taxing 99% of internet sales. 
So that growth has essentially come to, and, and all the growth that we've seen in recent years in, in retail sales, um, up until COVID, had, <laughs> this is kind of a mess. Uh, COVID certainly changed things, expenditures from services to goods for a short period because you couldn't get services. Now we're seeing people move back to goods, and so we're still seeing a little bit of growth in retail. Um, but the growth, the growth margins that we had seen in recent years that were attributable to, well, to internet sales are going away. And Mr. Moss, your point, uh, when we see a changing demographic, right, the people who spend a lot on retail goods, um, that demographic is drying up as well. Um, so when I say we need tax modernization, we have to recognize that if you tax a diaper, but you don't tax a haircut, right, that you're going to re you're going to see that you know fewer and fewer people are buying retail goods, and spending a great deal of money on retail goods. Younger population and the younger and the older population both spend more money on services, and and so the the middle area the 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 middle cohort as you said that spends on goods is is dissipating a little bit so. Retail sales is one of those uh, tax modernization techniques that's desperately needed at the state. First of all, it would make it more equitable. Why would you tax a diaper and not a haircut? Um, but second of all, uh, that, that trend of growth in retail is, is going to be dissolving for, for a couple of reasons, one of which is demographics. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Well, Greg, I think it's fair to say the only, only thing predictable about the economy is its unpredictability. <laughs> so uh, I'll tell you what, I, you know, this has got to be like picking up mercury for you if you drop a thermometer. Uh, you know, trying to, as you said, trying to project what's coming around the corner, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's going to be a challenge. But, you know, thanks definitely for the update. But I think if one thing is positive, what we're looking in terms of ongoing regional initiatives about bringing in these other businesses now with the offshore wind and uh, the broadband coming in with the cables and everything, the, the potential we have for significant economic development in the region, you, you know, I, th I think is going to be a safe, you know, uh, you know, a life preserver that's going to be thrown to us. Absolutely, and I think if you look if you look across the nation, you'll recognize one of the things that successful regions have done is they've invested in themselves, right? And it will take as a region to invest in ourselves to make the most of I think of, of these initiatives that we have in front of us. Hey, thanks a bunch. Thank you. Really appreciate it, Mr. Mayor, members of council and school board. At this time, Ron Agnar, the city's real estate assessor, will give a presentation. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, members of council, school board members, Mr. Manager. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, this is the first time, and I verified this with my predecessor, who was here 45 years. It's the first time we've been here for the five-year forecast. I normally come in in February and give you a, a forecast with much more reliable numbers than we can do on a five-year. <coughs> so, um, what we decided to do after talking to, to Kevin um, is to just give you a quick look at the path to the accurate forecast that we're going to give you and the path to the land book, which is the final say on what the increase is going to be. Um, <clears throat> so I've prepared a, a milestone, basically a milestone chart here that just reads left to right and, and down. Um, the first block is September 1st, and that already happened. That, that's the land book that we finished on, uh, I believe it was August 19th, um, and then seven days later we turned in the five-year projection um, to management services. Um, so as we go forward, um, 
as we go forward in this process of a year, it takes a year to go through this whole process, as soon as that land book is done, we start again. We start the, the land book process again. It takes a whole year to get there. But there's some other things going on at the same time. One is the Board of Equalization here and start as soon as the land book is done. So we work on that through December. <clears throat> the reassessment starts as soon as the land book is done. And we don't have all the sales. We need sales through December 31st. Everybody needs to be treated the same equitably and uniformly. So that is going on at the same time. The sales validation process is going through all year long. You got to get out there to the sales, look at them as soon as you can from the time they sold to see what was there at the time that it sold. That's, that's an annual cycle that goes on all the time. <clears throat> and then we, we kind of have to slow down a little bit and we get to our October, our first quarterly new construction. So October 1st new construction is due uh, and that's our nine month cycle. Um, and then we have another new construction cycle while we're carrying on with the assessments and the appeals and, and so forth. And that's our sixth month, which is December 31st or January 1st. And you can see from the slide behind me where we are. We're in between those two areas. We're at about 50% of looking at the sales that we have available to us, which is not all of them. Some of those sales are behind us that we haven't looked at yet. We haven't gotten to them four or five weeks of sales, and then we've got approximately six weeks of sales in front of us that haven't happened yet. That's a lot of data that we don't have yet to give you an accurate forecast uh, today. Um, we do cut off the sales as of December 31st, um, and that's so everybody is treated the same. Um, and then at that point in January, before we come to you in February, we are able to, um, to, to give a very good, really uh, market-derived appraisal of the neighborhoods in the city, commercial and residential. In other words, we have posted them. It's what we call posting them or certified them. They're good. We've gone through all the neighborhoods. We've gone through all the data, and we have that. Um, and so come December 31st, as the code requires us to do, we will have been through that, and that will be solid. There'll be some things that affect it, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so those market adjustments are not a forecast. They, they're real. There will be some things that can, can adjust them, and I'll talk about it in just one second. So January 31st, um, we're done. Last Tuesday of February, we come to you, and we tell you the results of our analysis. And then March 1st, we send the notices out. The public gets notification of all their assessments and all their neighborhoods. And then September 1, we're done. So we started September 1, we ended September 1. <clears throat> so how much of that was good? How much of it was not so good? Well, the first part of it, the market derived using all the sales. And, you, and I must point out here, Sometimes the last six months or the last three months of sales tell us more than the first six months or the first three months. I'd rather have more recent data than, than earlier data. Um, and in commercial, we look at sales that are year, two years, sometimes three years old because of the lack of data. But the market data is good, but there's still things that have to be forecasted when I come to you in February. And they are, as bulleted here, First thing is April 1 new construction. I don't know what it's going to be. I have to estimate it. I estimate it off history. Um, I look back several years. I look at the market, what's going on, new construction. But it's an estimate at that point when I come to you in February. The July 1 new construction, that's the biggest new construction period that we have. Um, and it's, it's a, that, one, that one is hard to estimate, but we do a pretty good job of estimating based on history. Now, we even did a good job last year during a pandemic, which was the first time, but I think there was a little bit of luck in that. Um, and then as those notices go out, I hear appeals to the assessor all the way through August. So if something's not right, our data's not right, we've done something wrong, here's our chance to fix it, and it doesn't have to go to the Board of Equalization, the assessor can fix it himself. I have to estimate what that's gonna be. It's not normally an increase, although we have people that do appeal on increase, but it's normally decreases, so we have to estimate it. And then plats and rezonings 
we can only, by state code, we can only assess those once a year. That's on July 1. So I have to estimate what's going to happen between January 31st or February 1st and July 1st with all of these things. They're all forecast. And I don't like forecasts. No appraisers like forecasts. We like data, uh, and we like to use our data to develop opinions. But it's necessary. So if you add together, as the bottom bolded letters say, if you add together what we know, and then you add what we don't know, and we're forecasting, um, that's what we're going to give you in February. And that will tell you in dollars what we expect the land book to be. This is the, the, from that point forward, this is how we get to the land book. These aren't for, forecasts at this point. Again, March 1, real estate assessments go out. March through August, appeals to the assessor. July 31, new construction, 12 months. July 31, plats and zonings. First week of August, normally the commissioner of revenue is finished uh, with their senior disabled KIAs, et cetera. Um, because they have to be complete for us to be complete. Um, because the assessor in this city runs the land book, it runs the inventory, it calculates the levies. Uh, this is not put out to IT or any other department. Uh, we take care of all the balancing, all the auditing, the internal auditing for ourselves. Um, and then at that point, when we're satisfied it's all balanced, I make a phone call, usually a phone call over to Lee Henderson and say, Time for you to post this to accounts receivable. At that point, there's no backing, there's no backing out of it. It is what it is at that point once it goes into accounts receivable. So the land book um, process is complete and actual results are reported to you second time with actual results, not the forecasted. And um, typically that difference is not a whole lot. I mean, we, we're, we're pretty good at that forecast because we have so much market data is available to us. It's normally between a tenth of 1% and three tenths of 1%. And if you look at the chart behind me, you can see that the blue is the actuals for the last five years, and the orange was what we projected in February. So you can see from the chart below it, we're talking tenths of a percent difference. Um, I will say last year was a unique year, a very unique year, sitting in the middle of a pandemic to be able to do that. Um, and that just comes with, uh, like I said earlier, maybe just a little bit of luck based on experience and judgment. So five-year projections. The one we just submitted to Kevin on August 26, 2021. The left side, the blue, are the actuals. That's what happened in the last five-year projection we gave for five years. And you can see we're with 3.1 all the way up to 3.9 on that fifth year. Um, so those are the actuals. And you compare the projected, what I just gave him, in August to 23 to 27, we, we kind of start at that same trend. So we're saying 3.9, we're coming out of the gate with 3.9, but as you can see from the blue chart, it gets less reliable as you get down to the bottom of it because it's so far out. And here's five years projected back five years ago in 16. How did we do? Well, we didn't do too bad. If you look at 3% across the board, um, that's not a hard one to come up with, just 3% across the board. Um, but you can see what we actually did in that five years. We, we started creeping up. 3-1, 3-1, got to 3-9. Well, 3-9, that's not a good projection. That's, that's a percent, as far as I'm concerned. That's a whole percent, and that's a lot of money. So some observations. First off is five-year projections are our speculation on our part. We don't enjoy doing forecasts. We like to have our data, and we like to rely on our data and give our opinions based on that data. And it's based off current market activity. Five-year forecasts are educated guesses at best, not supported by any direct evidence, data analysis, or conclusions. Um, 
reliable projections will be complete January 31st for our annual report in February. The data that we need to finalize the February projection for City Council for residential and commercial properties is still being collected and analyzed. Lower price, so this is worth, no, this is noteworthy. Lower price homes are still appreciating at a much faster rate than higher price homes. Although we are starting to see a pickup of, of sales um, that uh, are in the higher price category, but not as many as the lower ones. Mu much more sales in the lower price and much higher percentages is what I'm seeing right now as all of these neighborhoods come to me. Um, Continuing on with basically my opinions is the pandemic Delta variant or whatever variant it is at the time uh, will have negative consequences in this, in this FY23 projection I'm giving you. Uh, it, it has to in, the, in some commercial properties. It, it has to, one more year at least, it has to, we have to, we're, we're gonna see I believe, and it's not finished, but I do believe we're going to see another, another reduction in value on some hotels, offices, and shopping centers. And this most likely will partially offset the overall increase attributable to residential. This happened exactly like this last year. You know, I thought I was at one place. When I finished the residential, when I finished the commercial, I wasn't in that place. I was in a different place. So I expect that's going to happen again this year. That's my opinion. Um, residential property values continue to rise because of low interest rates and the low inventory of houses for sale. It's still very low. As a matter of fact, it's as low right now as it's been in a good while as far as the inventory goes. But if those inventories in increase and that interest rate rises, a stabilization of value increases at least is going to happen in 22. I'm not saying we won't have any increases. I'm saying they may stabilize. They may not go up as high as what we've seen in the past. That's an opinion. Um, inflation is expected to continue and to rise along with an increase in what, what I follow is the 10-year Treasury notes to tell me what mortgages are going to look like. And we did have a, a bump up. Um, and it looks like that those rates are going to be over 4% in 2022. Now, that's an opinion. <laughs> Again, it's an opinion, but I can tell you, if that interest rate goes to four and a half, five percent with these values that we have on the books right now, this run's gonna, gonna come to an end. How fast it comes to end will rely on how much these interest rates do go up and when they stop. But with the values we've got, you add another another one percent interest rate to the average uh, home buyer, he won't be able to afford it, what he was looking at. Um, and then supply chain problems. This is actually a good segue to come in because I see problems with that as well. Our new construction has been down three quarters in a row. Um, and our new construction trend um, the rising construction costs appears it's going to continue for at least a while. So new construction growth is expected to decline as it has in the last three quarters compared to the same three quarters in 2020. And here's an interesting statistic, I think, or fact. We've only had in 2021 um, up to, I believe, September, the first nine months, yes, we've only had 66 foreclosures in the city of Virginia Beach. Our typical before the financial crisis, um, our typical range of foreclosures in a year would be somewhere five to 600, something like that. Of course, you know it was in the thousands when we had the financial crisis, but that wasn't typical. So um, that has got to affect the market at some point. So now, I was asked, to provide six months of data, I believe it was Councilman Moss that asked for the first six months of sales um, in, the, in the city of Virginia Beach. And it's not a whole lot I can do with just six months of sales. It's not enough. Like I said, I'd rather have the last 
the most current six months rather than the ones that started off in the year. But there is data there, and you can analyze it. And that data showed that with 6,041 sales, compared to the previous six months, um, was actually down 4.66%, which it could have gone either way. That's not really that significant, but it's a fact out of the data set that Mr. Moss asked for. Um, the median sales price January through June was $307,500. Compared to the previous six months of $302,000, July through December 2020, it was a plus 2%. But if you compare that to the previous January through June in the previous year, it's a little different. The 3075 is still what we're comparing against, but the median at that time was only 282,950. So that would be an increase of 8.7%. Um, I'm not sure how relative that is because it's, it's a small snapshot of the market, um, but it's something that I could get out of, of the uh, data set that was requested. Another thing is residential sales ratios compared to the previous year's land book. 86%. Remember, that's last year's land book. That's the certified ones that are on the land book that are going to be collecting the taxes on December 5th. So that in itself just, it does tell me something. And we look at it starting about July of each year. We start looking at it to see what that ratio is. But we have other statistics we need to look at as well. If I looked at what we call the worksheet values, which that's the appraiser's with their work in progress throughout up to this point in the year, we can mess with that, that value and that data in those neighborhoods over and over, and we do, over and over and over again through the year because it's not certified. It's, it's when, when I say certified, it will certify it, but worksheet values are just that. They're just worksheet values where we're, we're going in there and we're seeing what's it, what's it gonna do? What's gonna be the final result? So the statistical, and that's 99%. So that tells you we're right at it, if it was correct, but we're only 50% complete. So there's just not enough data here to come up with a meaningful, accurate forecast. Um, but the statistics do tell us when we're done, the statistics do tell us how good a job that we did when we're finished, because we use coefficients of dispersion and price-related differentials and all kinds of other statistics, but they only tell us how good a job we did. They don't tell us where to go. What tells us where to go is these sales, and the sales we, when, we, when we give you the projection in February and then we give you the final land book, what we're looking at is what was the land book last year? The taxable value of the land book compared to the taxable value of the land book in dollars, not percentages, not statistics, in dollars. How much is it? And that's where the 3.9% came from this past year. We projected 3.7. We gave 3.9. So... That concludes it. I think February 18th is what I've got up behind me is when we'll be releasing our, our best forecast. Um, and we'll, we'll know exactly where we're going. I'll tell you at this point, it, it looks like it could be higher than what's projected. But with the commercial unknown into this, there's a lot of moving parts going on all at the same time. And we've got to bring all that, stop it, put the brakes on it, and, and uh, be able to certify it to be able to give you an accurate projection. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions? Mr. Moss. I do recall last year, I believe, was hotels were down 10%, but industrials were up in double digits, I think was the low teens, if I remember correctly. And uh, commercial was up slightly, wasn't down, if I remember. It was not as much, but it was up a little bit. And if I remember right, the overall distribution was like 17% non-residential, 83% was residential, at least that's yes, the ballpark. And I think the total taxable value ended up being something like $67 billion and some change, right? Yes, so for my colleagues, that would mean that basically 55 billion and $610 million of our tax base is residential, which you would suggest could potentially grow 1.39, 3, 3.9% which would get you up to $57.8 billion if you take that base of 55, 510. And if we incurred and assumed that the tax base went down versus up on that composite of the non-residential by 10%, which is probably in the ballpark, Aram, we would lose $1.4 billion of tax base for a net gain 
of 1.4 if you look at the 2.8 minus what you'd lose on the other balance. But when you go to the written report on page 11 and you look at, this also talks about seasonally adjusted settled homes, and I think the sales price relative to the book value means more than sales to sales, but none, put that aside, this says in the end that the median home sales prices have reached record highs with July 21, 2021 prices recording a 20% increase over the housing bubble of 2007. So clearly we know what our residential tax base was in 2007. We have that information historically. And we know whether or not 1.39% of our thing would bring us within 21%. So I'm just suggesting not the exact price, but I do think we have more indicators that the bias is to over versus to under by doing those kind of, because either that or we're tremendously underperforming the national economy. And if I looked at the, the reports mentioned earlier, where I were a little bit under, we're not that much under. And so I really would like that six month data set I mentioned to you earlier, because I've been talking to people in the real estate industry and it doesn't seem to match up either with that, what I've heard them tell me, versus my own, and it is anecdotal, the difference between the sales prices on my own, in my own neighborhood and what their book value is, because I went and looked that up as well, bigger differences. So I think the bias is to the upside. But I do think the most important thing you kind of said is going out, that this is not a future that will be repeated. And so my, my, my advice would be is that maybe if we don't decide to adjust rates, that we should be banking this non-sustainable growth and lowering our long-term forecast and harvesting that money for investments to grow the tax base rather than investing those differentials into services recurring costs when we, we are not going to see that same growth rate in real estate. And I do agree that the, the interest rates are going to rise and, the, and we've seen price adjustments before and we're better off not, I think, tying that money up into higher service levels, but instead either returning some of it to the taxpayers or investing it in economic development, things that are gonna grow our tax base. I think that's the observations I took away and I thank you for your report, but I would like to get that universe of data. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hey, John, anybody else at this point? Okay, can I say just one last thing, Mr. Mayor? Sure. And that just made me think of it, I meant to say it anyway. I know all of you love to see the neighborhood report when we give you the annual report. It's like two reports, the annual report, which has got the 40 pages, and then the neighborhood report that gives it to you by district. I can already tell you, we're gonna see neighborhoods that are gonna be much higher than what the total tax bill is gonna be. I mean, I've seen enough to tell you that. that we, we can see some neighborhoods at 15% um, easily. But as I said earlier, if you've got something else dragging it down in the commercial, and you're not getting that 15% across the board, across the board, and that's what's happened in the past, whatever percent it was, a lot of times it was across the board, and it's not, it's on the lower end, so the tax dollars don't come in at that same rate. I just thought I'd add that. Okay, Ron, thank you so much. I tell you, what, this is uh, part of a puzzle that we're gonna have to put together, thank you. Mr. Mayor, at this time, Eric Schmood from the Commissioner of Revenue's office will come and give a presentation. That's the real commissioner. <laughs> Eric, welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, I am the chief deputy for the commissioner. The commissioner's out of town. He's at the uh, House Appropriations meeting. Um, he's the president of his association. Uh, he sends his regrets, um, and uh, I'm honored to be here to address both uh, council members and school board. Um, let's see if I know what I'm doing. Or not.
Excuse me. All right. So here are the, um, the historical data, basically, on personal property. Vehicles is in the blue. The orange is uh, business personal property. Um, that's what the businesses in the uh, city uh, pay for uh, furnitures and fixtures. Um, as you can see, the growth has been tremendous in personal property over the last four years, um, increasing about a little over 28%. The growth in um, uh, business personal property has been relatively uh, stable and steady. Uh, it's 9% over the whole period, uh, as you can see. Um, this is U.S. vehicle sales. You can see what COVID did in uh, 2020. This estimate for 2021 looks to be a little high um, from the data that I'm seeing and what we're hearing. Um, uh, with the semiconductor problem, uh, these numbers are gonna come down. The other thing that we're seeing that is of note is um, the per vehicle value is skyrocketing. Um, uh, J.D. Power actually for October 1 had the average vehicle being sold at $44,000. So here's what we're talking about for the growth rate. Um, historically, it's been 4.2%. Um, we're projecting about 6%, and the reason we're projecting that is um, the new car prices are skyrocketing like we were talking about. Um, we see the uh, um, manufacturing catching back up once the uh, chip issue is resolved. Uh, right now, what you're seeing is a lot of high-priced cars and trucks being made because that's where the manufacturers make, can make the money. They're not gonna waste chips making economy cars. Um, and then we see, see the uh, growth uh, kind of trailing off. but. We do see significant growth into the future for the next uh, three to four years uh, based on the trends that we're seeing now, which is um, this growth in new cars and then the, um, actually the bigger number, which is the used car or what, you know, the used car price is stabilizing and staying relatively um, high. Um, and there is some uh, bifurcation happening there it's the newer used cars that are appreciating. Um, a lot of the older used cars are not appreciating at nearly the same rate. So basically in summary, um, again, we see uh, above average growth for uh, the next four years in personal property. Uh, business personal property should be relatively stable uh, we don't see any, and that's usually driven by new businesses relocating into Virginia Beach. So um, when you get a new uh, Home Depot or a uh, Whole Foods or something like that, those tend to be the drivers that help increase the value of the business personal property. Um, and that will be, that, that, could change depending on obviously the economic environment that happens within the next uh, two to four years. Um, I did put in here some wild cards. Uh, there is some talk about what the electrification, the EVs will do to um, combustible engine cars and their values, uh, how quick that switchover happens and how that will impact values of cars. Uh, that would be a, if there's a significant degradation in value of combustion engine, obviously that's gonna have a big effect on the personal property values because um, that's the bulk of what is being taxed in the city. And, yep, I think that's it. Any questions? Always I have questions. Mr. Moss, I'm shocked. You a question. <laughs> I study all this stuff, so I, you know, this is important. Um, one of the things you mentioned is a differential. New cars are up by about 11% on average, and uh, cars less than five years of age are there where the 24.2% is. But the point I want to mention is what impact this has on the people who pay it. This is, I know I've talked before about this. 
uh, one in three car sales, new car sales, are financed over 72 months. And one, this is national data, so I'm sure we apply. One in six of those loans are actually negative in value, meaning they've turned in a car not fully paid off and take on booger debt. This is a very big bill that comes. It affects uh, the lower income people the most because it is a regressive rate because the car that you buy doesn't necessarily reflect the necessity of what the price is, other things are driving it. So I do believe this is below, if you went to last year's five-year forecast here and saw what we projected to be the growth rate in this, it would have been much lower than what we're going to see. And I think we have to think hard about making a one-time rate adjustment to reflect this, I'll call it an outlier increase that puts a tremendous burden on our working families and our community. But it would be nice to see, and I know I pose these questions, so I want all of you to know. I've asked to look, tell us the universe of vehicles that you have registered exempt and non-exempt in your, you know, because we have a lot of vehicles that are exempt from taxation, whether it's for military or disability or senior citizens, but they're in the database. Right. And then differentiating that between new sales and used and somewhat by age so we can get an idea of some stratification and granularity about uh, what a rate relief would mean and who it would benefit the most as we try to take, since we certainly don't want to get a windfall profit from an inflationary effect of which uh, no family could uh, anticipate. And this is a one-time bill. And if you look at the delinquency rate and people paying that delinquent paying that tax, that's been going up. And that should be telling us how people are struggling to pay this. So we need to be taking a hard look at that rate structure when this comes around based on your more uh, finite revenues. Because this is a, a very, uh, we got to make money because we can't just replace $160 million. But we don't have to benefit from an outlier inflation rate of, you know, of maybe blended 15% when you take the lower cars into effect. That's just an observation. I don't have a question, but I look forward to getting the data. Thank you very much. I can tell you that we have uh, 23,500 more or less military exemptions and the newly enacted uh, disabled veteran exemption, um, 3,642 disabled vets took advantage of it. Uh, you also left in place the special rate for uh, disabled vets that are not 100% permanently and totally disabled and uh, 382 vets took advantage advantage of that exemption, or reduction, I should say. Uh, you do have one other exemption, and that is for EMS personnel. You're taxing it at a millionth of a cent. And do you know how many cars are in the taxable base for this thing you send out in May? Do you know that number? I, I can, I'll, I'll get you that number. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, anyone else? Okay, Eric, thanks a bunch. Uh, very helpful information. Kevin, how are you doing? Doing great, Mayor. Doing great. All right. Apologize. Let me get some. Let me try that again. Hey. There right. we go. Okay. Um, so I figure that uh, Greg covered a good portion of the economic data as part of his presentation, and Ron and Eric both covered personal property and real estate. So I'm going to shift my portion of the presentation and talk a little bit higher level about the city's five-year forecast and looking at revenue trends and expenditure trends over the forecasted period. So the documents that were included in the Friday packet and before the school board members today are uh, much more comprehensive than they were in previous years in terms of five-year forecast, as we've included every fund uh, within the city's operating budget as well as the schools at the request of Councilman Moss to get this holistic picture. Um, so even though we've included all the funds, I'm certainly not gonna drag everybody through that today, but talk about some at a high level. So starting with revenues. Uh, so here's a visual of the real estate tax revenues that we're projecting over the forecasted period. As Ron was talking earlier, um, the real estate assessments are anticipated to grow about 3.9%. And so if I could take just a moment to familiarize everybody with this in looking at the graph behind me. Um, so the orange line there represents the actual amount collected each of the years. Uh, the blue line represents the budgeted amount. 
and then the green line is the projected amount over the forecast period. So as you can see, the budget to actuals are very close in the real estate uh, projections as we work really close with the real estate assessor's office to determine what these are gonna be and do this projection. And these are typically based on the, or not typically, these are will be reevaluated later on in the budget process once he provides his February report. That will be the new assessment base that we use to do a revised projection ahead of the proposed budget coming in line. Uh, so this is a visual, um, again, looking at real estate, including the same baseline projection that was included in the previous slide, except with one additional um, reference point. That yellow line referenced here is a, uh, the equivalent of a 3.6, excuse me, 4.3 cent real estate tax increase. Um, typically, the practice has been that we have followed city council's existing policy and tax rate structure in doing the projection of the five-year forecast. Uh, we feel like we were pretty confident based on resolution approved by city council in September that should the bond referendum be passed, they were comfortable moving forward with the proposed 4.3 cent financing plan for the um, sustainable, the sustaining, excuse me, the payment of the debt service associated with that and the long-term sustainability of those 21 projects. So um, everything that's represented here in the, that gap is about $28 million. Um, included in the document on page 46 is a newly, to be newly established fund that would capture all the dedicated revenues associated with this, as well as for the debt service payment associated with the um, referendum projects totaling $567 million. Um, so this is really just a five-year forecast. Uh, everybody's familiar with referendums, aware that that's really a longer term. It's a 10-year spend plan and really a 20-year financing plan. So the rate structure in place will certainly sustain the debt service over that 20-year period, um, and at which point in time a future council will um, likely have a decision to make in terms of what to do with the capacity that's generated from that rate. So as uh, debt's retired, capacity will accumulate within that fund, and it could be utilized for the purposes of recapitalization of the existing infrastructure that gets put into place as a result of the bond referendum or I can't look into a crystal ball, but a future council could also make a determination that the rate could potentially go away. Um, but obviously, um, future decision, but it's only a five-year forecast. That's a much longer picture, bigger picture, but I'm sure we'll be briefing city council on um, those throughout the budget process. Um, if I could take a moment to do a little bit deeper dive into personal property. The Commissioner's Revenues Office provided us some slides and Eric came up here and presented on what assessed values are doing in the uh, car market. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the orange and the blue line are not closely as, as closely aligned as they are in the real estate um, graph and that's because personal property is one of our more difficult revenues to project. Um, part of the reason for this is simply the timeline. Uh, so 80% of the revenues collected in the month of June um, so June 21, we finally got a picture at the end of the fiscal year how our revenues were doing. We won't understand how our current year projections are doing until the end of this fiscal year, at which point in time the FY23 budget will already have been adopted. So we're really trying to do this over a 24-month period, which makes it really difficult considering the volatility in the market. In addition to that, um, there's multiple categories. So Eric was talking about the vehicle assessments and personal property or business personal property, but there's also other components with tax rates, RVs, mobile homes, um, other taxable categories with varying rates. And then although our projections and commercial revenues don't always, um, in terms of the assessment growth, we use our assessment growth, but our revenues don't always mirror up with that because there's other factors to take into account as well such as collection rate, exoneration rates, and so forth and so on. I think Councilmember Moss was just alluding to this, talking about the accounts receivable. Um, typically each year, this revenue has been trending where we receive about 84% collection rate on the annual billings for this. So there is a gap that um, typically is not collected in a given year, and sometimes um, it could be for various reasons. Um, perhaps the individual moved as, you know, Homes are one thing, vehicles are very fluid. Uh, perhaps an individual moved and then upon, upon responding, they tell the Commissioner Revenue's office, hey, well, I'm not there anymore, and then it gets exonerated and wiped off. So um, assessments are certainly so, a tool that we use, but then there's a little bit more art massaging um, the revenue projection associated with this. 
Overall, though, we're projecting this revenue to grow um, about 8%, um, which is roughly about $14 million when comparing the 22 budget to the 23 um, projection. Keeping in mind, we're still continuing to grow out of our conservative base that we had revised everything down at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is certainly one where we had anticipated a lower collection rate. Uh, but as you can see, 21 did well, and we're anticipating that to continue, especially based on the uh, used car market and what's going on with that. Looking at general sales, um, you can see by the orange line there uh, that general sales significantly overperformed our F FY21 budgeted projections. In fact, um, that year bucked the trend of long-term growth of about 3% year over year in general sales. And that year, general sales actually grew about 15%. Greg stole my thunder a little bit as I was going to talk about um, the Supreme Court case, which was South Dakota versus Wayfair that made a determination that sales tax should be remitted to the locality which the sales actually occurred. Um, so we do believe that this is a part of the new base, but what we're hesitant in doing is continuing year over year growth of that amount. Um, we believe that this revenue is going to stabilize and return more closer in line with the historical growth about 3% a year. Uh, but again, going from the budgeted 21, excuse me, budgeted 22 to the 23 projection, um, we're anticipating about $9 million increase or 11% growth in this revenue. Uh, looking at the restaurant or meals tax, um, this revenue has rebounded much quicker than we were originally anticipating. You can see FY21 overperformed our budgeted estimates. Uh, this, again, was a revised COVID-19 revenue that we thought was going to go down significantly more than what it actually did. Um, we're certainly happy to see uh, this revenue is rebounding. It's shared with various funds, such as the TIP fund, um, and that's certainly one that we've been monitoring over the last year or two, uh, mindful that some of the tourism-related revenues and the decline in those was going to have a negative impact on the TIP fund. Um, so this is certainly promising looking forward. Uh, again, looking, projecting budget FY 22 to 23 initial estimate, um, we're anticipating about an 18% growth in this or about $11 million. Hotel tax, similar to meals tax or restaurant tax, is dedicated across various different funds. Um, you'll see here this is the, represents the total 8% citywide tax on um, hotels. Uh, this revenue stream has certainly rebounded quicker than we were anticipating as well. You can see 21 overperformed, and our budgeted 22 to 23 growth is about 18% increase, or about $4.3 million. Um, something that's worth noting on this is that this is not inclusive of the flat tax that's charged, and uh, City Council in their current year's operating budget extended the uh, flat tax, $1 per room night, um, per room night dedication to the TIP fund. They dedicated that through the end of the current fiscal year. However, going forward in 23 and beyond, unless otherwise directed, uh, that flat tax will actually um, go away and no longer be represented in the TIP fund. And I'll speak to the TIP fund in just a moment. Uh, so moving on to general government expenditures. Uh, so some of the baseline assumptions that we had included in this included a compensation increase uh, beginning year one at 3% and each year thereafter at 2.5%. So this is really a placeholder for the purposes of the um, five-year forecast as we don't know what, the shape, what that would actually look like, and that's obviously pending city council approval. Uh, it could come in the form of a merit increase, cost of living adjustment, or those funds could be utilized for the purposes of implementing a market salary survey. Um, something else, uh, the VRS, Virginia Retirement System rate, was assumed to increase 1.5% a year. Um, this is a good example as to why the five-year forecast should be used as a reference tool or a kind of breathing um, document that gets updated routinely or that we work throughout the budget process as this has already changed. We received word from VRS yesterday that the rate increase will actually be 1.9%. Um, so that's going to have a, about an additional $1.5 million impact on the general fund, for example, and I'll um, show that visually in just a moment. Other baseline assumptions included health insurance projected increase of 3% uh, employer contribution. Um, again, this is a placeholder for purposes of the five-year forecast. Uh, the city has a benefits executive committee, which we have with both city and schools, where we'll be um, making a determination of this later on in the budget process. 
One thing that we take into account is the utilization of the health fund balance. Um, during the pandemic, one thing that occurred was there was low utilization of health fund based on um, canceled elective procedures, um, and there, that low utilization resulted in a little bit higher um, than anticipated fund balance. So that would certainly be a tool that we'd be looking at to try to figure out how to smooth and find the right balance between employer and employee future contributions as healthcare costs are projected to go up. Also for full disclosure and transparency, the forecast does not take into account attrition savings. Vacancies have been fully loaded. Um, so it's not to say that attrition savings won't be utilized to balance the 23 budget or future years operating budgets as that has been a practice in previous years, but for the purpose of the forecast, um, they have been fully loaded. Um, and the other baseline operating um, account growth occurred about 2.3%, and that's what we assume for inflation. That's based on the Federal Reserve, um, St. Louis Federal Reserve, um, as their long-term um, inflationary forecast. Um, so like I said, this forecast does include all funds. Um, I'm only gonna walk through a few now, uh, but these baseline assumptions were applied for all of them with the exception of a few that had um, some particular instances that we needed to highlight. Uh, so this is the bottom line forecast of the general fund that was included in the document in front of you and the Friday Council, City Council's Friday packet. Um, you can see it was projected to run a deficit each year of the bottom line. Um, and, but 1.4 year one and growing to 8.1 or eight .1 million dollars roughly in year um, five of the forecast. So this is a slide representative of the increased VRS rate that we learned about yesterday. We included this. I know it's the first time everybody's seeing it, but this just reflects that additional increase of 1.5 million on the bottom line. Um, reality is VRS is the primary driver. Uh, resulting in expenditures exceeding revenues over the forecasted period. You can actually even see the trend VRS increases once every two years. Um, and so once we have this new rate from VRS that we got yesterday, it will be that for 23 and 24, and then they'll revisit it and establish a new rate 25 and 26 and so forth and so on. Um, so, like I said, it includes all funds. That was the general fund. Um, something worth highlighting and noting um, is the five-year forecast for the waste management fund. As you can see here, expenditures are projected to exceed revenues throughout the forecasted period within the waste management fund. A few driving factors of this, revenues within the waste management fund are fee-driven. Um, so they're relatively flat with the exception of whenever you have new growth in residential units. Um, so the fee, $25 per residential unit per month, if you have new additional growth, then you grow the revenue. Outside of that, the course of growing the revenues, typically through fee increases. Um, so with the relatively flat level of growth in revenues and the operating expenditures growing with personnel increase projected throughout the forecasted period, as well as potential SIPSA increases. Um, the SIPSA tipping fee increased in the current year from $57 to $61. That's something that the Waste Management Fund has absorbed. As you can see there, the utilization of fund balance in the current year to balance the operating budget. Um, the decision was made to absorb that and not request a fee increase at this point in time as we didn't feel that um, households would be able to handle that in the midst of the pandemic. Um, Going forward, additional fee increase, or excuse me, um, cost increases related to SIPSA are projected. Uh, through the middle years of the forecast, the tipping fees projected to grow from $61 to $63 per ton. In addition to that, the uh, waste management TFC recycling contract is anticipated to expire. Um, it's thought that the renegotiation of that could result in an additional $4 million impact to the waste management fund. So overall, um, we're gonna be revisiting this throughout the, for, or throughout the budget process to look at sustainable manners to get the waste management fund right back on track. But over the next five years, it's likely that a rate increase could be necessary to uh, get, the, get it in a sustainable manner. Another um, operating fund that I know everybody's interested in is a stormwater um, enterprise fund. So as you can see here, there's no projected deficit over the forecasted period. 
Um, this is a uh, special, excuse me, this is an enterprise fund that my staff was scrambling to uh, revisit and, and update for the purposes of the five-year forecast once the referendum was adopted because this also, like um, our revenue projections, has gone with the September resolution approved by city council that says the ERU rate fee will be frozen until FY28. So that has been removed from this bottom line forecast of the stormwater enterprise fund. And again, this is just the enterprise fund based on the ERU. This is not inclusive of the new fund to be established for the 4.3 cent dedication. And this is also not inclusive of the CIP. Um, funding has been maintained to keep fund maintenance in place within the CIP based on the ERU. But whenever city council sees the stormwater CIP, that's whenever they'll see the increase that they recently approved through the use of ARPA funds of plusing up to maintenance funding by $44 million um, and the stormwater CIP is to be expended through FY26. Um, and the last fund to give a high level review on because there's always a lot of ask and questions related to the TIP fund. Uh, you can see here that over the forecasted period, the TIP fund is in a sustainable manner, in a sustainable place. Um, this is certainly uh, a different from a year ago at this point in time when we were looking at this. Revenues are rebounding quicker than we were initially anticipating through the dedications that go to the TIP fund, which is good. Uh, you'll see there's the utilization in the box, in the orange box there, of $11.3 million in fund balance in 24, and then slowly goes down to 338000 that's related to the debt service associated with the Atlantic Park project. Um, and then the reason the fund balance goes away is a combination of growth and revenue, as well as retirement and other debt service obligations within the TIP fund related to the convention center. So through the forecast period, the TIP fund is on a sustainable path. Um, beyond this, looking in the out years, it begins to um, tell a little bit different story to where um, future decisions and determinations will be need to, need to be considered on um, whether to potentially extend some of the um, existing dedications that are set to sunset beginning in FY28 or make other reductions within the TIP fund to get it back in a sustainable manner. So closing thing, just a few unknowns um, and things worth highlighting that weren't necessarily included in the baseline. Um, we know that there's discussions and um, coming down the pipeline are minimum wage increases um, from the General Assembly. It's projected to go up to $12 an hour in FY23. This is likely most, um, most likely to negatively impact the Parks and Rec Special Revenue Fund, which has a high utilization of part-time positions. Um, we don't have an overall cost related with this yet or a plan for this, but I know that Parks and Rec is certainly working with HR and the budget office, and this is something we're going to be reviewing throughout the budget process. Um, something else we're trying to be mindful of is the market salary survey and the total compensation survey. The last time one of these was conducted, it was on a smaller scale, and it was before my time at the city. I think it was about 2010, and at that point in time in 2011, all we had available was $1 million to put in the operating budget towards that, and I do remember that at least. Um, but that certainly wasn't um, a full implementation of that. So um, I suspect that the findings of this could be a costly um, endeavor. Um, so we'll certainly need to be mindful of that and what that might look like to either fully implement or partially implement. Um, and then obviously the um, ongoing impacts of the COVID-19 Unlike a year ago at this point in time when I was talking about unknowns and the revenues, it's not really what we're talking about impacts of COVID-19, but really more the supply chain issues and the temporary increase related to inflation. Um, we've used 2.3% as a long term. Greg did a great job covering this earlier. We do think that this is going to be a temporary spike in inflation. Um, especially related to construction costs. And that's going to be something we're mindful of as we work with all the CIP section managers throughout the budget process to ensure that projects are um, funded, properly funded so that inflation does not um, delay those or squish out of the projects. And with that being said, I'm ready to turn it over to schools. I don't know how we are on time. Good. Any, any questions? Beverly. <laughs> 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 Beverly, then John. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, my, my question has to do with the VRS increase. And you may know this, but I'm hoping you'll know this. But, you know, wh what is the driving force for that increase? And, you know, who, who makes that decision on the increase? 
so um, it's a it's a VRS. It's it's a state board, yeah. um, and they are looking at a lot of different variables, inclu including the long term liability, um, what the um, actuarial return are on the funds investments. I think that um, previous to this last revision, um, my staff's more familiar with it than I am. It just happened yesterday. Uh, it, the long term projection was based on a seven percent rate of return. Um, it's possible that they could have modified that. Something I do know, based on an April um, correspondence, something they were looking to uh, review and, and take under consideration is the possibility of revising their underlying methodology uh, related to the longevity of individuals, and that certainly could extend the long-term liability of the fund, which could result in them making a rate adjustment up to cover that longer-term liability. So um, there's a lot of components that go into it. And then once it's uh, determined what our portion of that um, pool is, then that's when they determine what our rate is. Thank you. Thank you. John. Uh, my page 22, but you want to get it back from the slide? It's, it's on the slide deck that I had, but I realized more things were added, but it's a real estate tax slide. Yes. Uh, that's that's certainly just what's in the general fund, but I would like to have, and maybe the footnote could be updated to say where the difference is between the $67 billion that appears on our bond prospectus that we're in debt and what goes to general fund. I would just like to have an itemization of those taxable properties, and town center is probably part of that, whatever it is that aren't accounted for and aren't contributing to the general fund. I'd like to be educated on that. My other people would too. Uh, I want to turn now, going back to some of the, I think, minimum wage increases. If we're not thinking by 24, 25, that we're paying $20 an hour, we're, we're being mistaken. So we just need to true that up and show the reality and not kid ourselves that it's, we don't know what's coming. I think we'd be probably a little bit better off understanding what our unfunded liabilities are. Uh, on the garbage, I know there was some discussion about that overpass, so I'm sure this, that's not, that discussion still outstanding. Is that correct? That's not included in, okay. Because uh, the reason I get back, uh, using the fund balance, and I think we, if we have these deficits, I think fees should, you know, I, was, I know people weren't happy with me when I supported this fee, but I think this is the fee that has to pay its way. But I do believe at the same time, and I know Mrs. Henley has mentioned this many times, we need to be figuring out a new technology or something that allows us to ch charge people relative to what they're putting at the street. Yeah. If putting up three cans, like some of my neighbors do, or sometimes six cans, or I don't know, but we have, as we raise this rate, the pressure is going to increase about charging people for what they put out there, so we just need to get ahead of that game and, 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 and talk about that, but I do believe this is a fee that, that if you use it, you gotta pay for it, it's like water. Uh, on stormwater, uh, Mr. Mayor, I really do believe, even though I know what this is talking about, the fund, but I don't think we do ourselves a credit if we don't put on this same slide, too, the money that we have consistently put into the general fund to supplement the fee for workload and also to reflect the $44 million we just appropriated because people see this and they don't, they're not making the integration. They're not following that. We've got to put it on a single place so that people can see the substantial additional uh, revenues that we had discretion on that we put to eliminate that backlog. I think they really need to see that. That's a substantial sum. Of, it's almost as much as one year of revenue in the fund. Um, now, this use of the fund balance on slide 32 on the tip, this gets to the thing that's on our agenda, correct? This is that loan. Is, well, I'm just trying to make sure this is separate from that. This will be... This will be related to the de the first year of the debt service payment um, associated with it. It's I say it's primarily driven by that. It's related to um, overall expenditures within the TIP fund exceeding revenues in that year. But it just so happens that's the first year that the debt service related parking and everything with the Atlantic Park Here's project. Here's why I mentioned it. I remember the huge consternation and fit, to be nice that was raised when we used $2 million of this fund to buy garbage trucks. You know, that was an outflow. I haven't heard any outrage from the people now getting the $16 million of inflow, but I think we're gonna be hearing from the people out in the heartlands in our districts when they say, why are we now, if we couldn't go one way, it seems like the check valve only goes one way. And so I think we need to be thinking hard about how much of that's structurally fixed 
and maybe something about the TIP fund and what, the, the money we raise to pay that, why are we subsidizing the TIP fund? They don't want to subsidize garbage trucks. I think it goes both ways. So I'd be interested in hearing some more on, on that. I do think, Mr. Mayor, also, I think we probably are more out of alignment than what this suggests, because I don't think we're going to accommodate the wage and salary survey, probably within the assumptions of this report. That's my gut. I could be wrong, but I'd rather have it something factored in, Mr. City Manager, and show a bigger number that we back off of versus acting like it's not going to happen, and then it's like, surprise, surprise, surprise. And the, long, the sooner you start educating the public about the issues and the choices, generally speaking, the less painful the reconciliation is on the backside. So I just think we just need to own up to that, what we think. And I realize it's a rough, but I think uh, we're not well served by understating it anyway. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, John. Yes. Is my mic on? Okay, there we go. I just wanted to, um, I guess, more so comment uh, to uh, my colleagues on council uh, in regards to the uh, minimum wage increase being uh, Parks and Recs being the uh, agency or department that you expect to have the most impact because they have the most minimum uh, wage or part-time uh, employees, that I hope that you will prioritize uh, Parks and Rec because of the child care that they serve for our city. We heard uh, the presentation say that the number one factor that small businesses are asking for is child care. And as of today, Parks and Rec is not able to sustain the child care that they're providing for our students, who students of our teachers and our staff, and uh, it really just branches out into the, the city beyond the, the job growth possibilities. Um, also, our social services and child welfare agencies are affected when we don't have adequate child care for the children in our city. So I, I hope you guys will prioritize parks and rec and child care because it helps grow our city in all kinds of different, different ways. And uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Owens. Uh, you know, be assured that you know, we are very much aware that it, you know, the importance, especially after school programs and activities for you know, you know, children to do as part of you know, just not only the development, but uh, a number of the um, mayors from the 757, you know, when we talk about youth violence and, you know, those type of interdictions that we, the actions that we can take, you know, that is certainly a very important part of what we have to do going forward for a lot of reasons. Thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. Oh. Just piggybacking a little bit on, on the uh, Parks and Rec, um, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but just this week, uh, we were notified that Parks and Rec is not able to do uh, before school care for some of our some of our areas, and 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 as as was pointed out earlier, and I'll just reiterate a little bit that what Ms. Owens just said that one of the major things that we can do to help small businesses in our city is to help with child care. So I hope you'll give that major consideration when you're working on the budget. No, I think so. And if we can try to expedite down time. Will, just want to mention, obviously, we'll have to see what the federal impact is, but since we are considering $54.9 million of reversion funds, we may be able to divert some of those funds to increase of wages to provide the service you've requested. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Mr. Mayor, members of council, and school board members, at this time, Crystal Pate, the chief financial officer for the schools, will be presenting on the school's forecast. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, members of city council, school board members, and city and school administration. I appreciate this opportunity to present the school division's five-year forecast. As Kevin mentioned, we're going to concentrate on our school operating budget, and there's much more information about our other funds um, within the document itself. So the local contributions calculated using the local revenue sharing formula continue to be the most substantial source of revenue for the school division. The Commonwealth of Virginia provides the next largest source of revenue through basic aid, categorical programs, incentive programs, lottery funded programs, and sales tax revenues. The remaining revenues are obtained from federal aid and other local sources of revenue. Oh, I'm sorry. For purposes of this five-year projection, the following assumptions were made. 
Student enrollment was down due to the pandemic at the end of fiscal year 21. It is projected to trend down slightly this fiscal year and increase slightly for fiscal year 23 and 24. For the remainder of the forecast period, we are projecting slight declines in enrollment. No, I'm on the wrong slide. The enrollment projections used in the forecast are based upon preliminary estimates provided by our demographer and should not be considered final projections. These projections may change in either direction, affecting revenue and expenditure estimates presented. However, even with the overall lower enrollment, projections we have seen increases in English language learners, students impacted by poverty, students receiving special ed services, and an overall learning loss for students. Students' needs are expected to have an increasing impact on the budget and could continue to worsen by the effects of the pandemic. The local revenue sharing formula projected by the city based on their analysis of the various revenues streams show local revenue is projected to increase 6.1% for fiscal year 23 and then 3% for each of the next three years with an increase of 2.8% in the final year of the forecast. Other local revenue is derived from miscellaneous sources such as tuition, fees, facility rentals, sale of salvage materials and capital assets, lost and stolen technology, and the stock farm program. We are not expecting to see increases in many of these revenue streams. We only projected a $50,000 increase each year to account for expected increase in revenue received from the stock farm program. As mentioned, state revenues include funding for basic aid to support the standards of quality, categorical programs, incentive programs, and lottery funded programs. Virginia operates under a biennial budget and at the beginning of the biennial, the state goes through a re-benchmarking process. This process documents the changes in state costs step-by-step step based on updates to factors such as enrollment, staffing standards for instructional positions, salaries of instructional positions, fringe benefit rates, support costs, inflation, sales tax funding, and division composite indices. Some components of the funding process are policy driven, but others are technical and must be updated through re-benchmarking. Re-benchmarking impacts the total cost of the direct aid formulas. It impacts both state costs and the required local share that localities must fund for the SOQ and other direct, direct aid programs with a local match. We are currently showing a moderate increase in state revenue over the forecast period. This increase has been adjusted down through the latest Virginia Department of Education calculation tool to reflect the lower enrollment projections. Moreover, the state made a decision early in the re-benchmarking process to include no loss funding into their baseline, not yet distributed to local school divisions. This was done due to the enrollment decline of approximately 40, 45,000 students across the state. State sales tax continued to rise during the pandemic, and it's been mentioned here earlier, um, we expect to see a moderate increase in the forecast period. So for each of the year of the forecast, we show a progressive increase over the five-year period of 2.5% for the first two years and 2.75% for the following two years, and then the last year, 3%. The primary source of federal revenue within the school operating budget is impact aid. Um, and we are expecting a declining enrollment and a possible decrease in the receipt of our federal impact aid cards. So we are projecting a decrease of $700,000 in the first year of the forecast period, and that's going from 13.5 million down to 12.8 million, and then projecting the revenue stream to remain relatively flat. The school reserve special revenue fund, that represents the one-time reversion funds used to augment the school operating budget and pay for recurring expenses. Use of these funds to pay for ongoing costs created a structural imbalance requiring re recurring revenue to resolve. We have been able to eliminate a good portion of this reserve over the last few years, and our goal is to eliminate this one-time funding by fiscal year 26. Expenditures are expected to grow over the forecast period, primarily due to compensation, rising health care costs, and inflation. Our expenditure assumptions are as follows. Compensation increases were included an increase of 3% for each year of the forecast period. The VRS rate is expected to decrease from 16.62% to 14.76 for the next biennium. A 1% increase is projected for the remaining biennia. Employer health insurance rates, similar to what the city projected, to increase by 3% for each year of the forecast periods. Non-personnel line items reflect an increase each year of 2.3% for inflation 
and realizing of the conversations this afternoon regarding inflation. Non-personnel items also reflect a restoration of 2%, which was the percentage cut at the end of fiscal year 2021. To balance the budget, it was restored in fiscal year 2022, and that was cut once again to balance the budget. Also, PAYGO funding, CIP is projected to increase $1 million for fiscal year 23, and then $500,000 each year of the remaining forecast period in an effort to reduce reliance on debt service. I would be remiss if I did not mention the current status of workforce challenges. As many are, we are facing a very tough job market. We have seen a large decline in applicants for advertised positions across many departments. Vacancies are in critical areas such as bus drivers, custodians, food service workers, and teachers. We are currently experiencing higher absentee rate among our teachers and few substitutes available to fill those spots. We are averaging a minimum of 100 instructional vacancies with a shrinking pool of newly trained teachers. We also are seeing non-instructional vacancies into the hundreds on a regular basis. Our division ranks number one in Hampton Roads for entry-level teacher compensation, but lags in several compensation milestones, including benefits, where we rank six out of seven when comparing employee premiums to neighboring school divisions. As we look to the future, minimum wage benchmarks set by the state over the next five years will significantly impact our pay scales. These unprecedented times require us to rethink compensation, benefits, scheduling, et cetera, in an effort to recruit and retain positions across the division. We no longer only compete with other divisions for personnel, we now also compete with the private sector, which tend to pay higher salaries, provide benefit packages, and incentive bonuses. Discussion on wage increases, retainage, and recruitment incentives are currently underway. Based on the revenue and expenditure assumptions outlined, the school division is projecting a deficit for the school operating fund for each of the forecast periods. As you know, there are many unknowns at the time of this projection, such as mandates, state funding levels, and new school board priorities. The school system faces some significant challenges in the coming years. The main risk factors, as mentioned, are employee compensation and workforce challenges, employee benefits, enrollment, and student learning needs, and the changes in state budget due to the rebenchmarking and change in governors. These items are not easily forecasted, and are there, and nor are there effects on revenues and expenditures. We believe adequate funding is essential to the school division's success, especially in light of the staffing challenges and compensation that we currently face, and will continue to face in the near future, as well as the lingering effects of the pandemic. This school administration and school board feel it a privilege to work with you to ensure that the children of the city are for the finest education possible. That concludes the presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Moss. <laughs> Go to page 94 of the report, because the report is much more insightful than the slides. Because um, it says here that for the 12th consecutive year, and I don't remember if all 12 years, but consistently the school board has under-executed the amount that we appropriated. Consistently under-executed. This prior budget year was 14.445, I think seven, seven, eight million dollars. That's pretty close. And so if you're under-executing and the under-execution is greater than the deficit that you're having to fill, it's hard to say you have a structural deficit because you can't execute the money that we give you. I'm just an observation because I think that's kind of like, it makes it sound like there's a big problem, but in reality, it's not a big problem because clearly something, going, maybe your execution is the big issue, not the delta of money. I'm just pointing that out for others. But it also gets to the heart of funding formulas. They work great when times are good because you overspend, and they work bad when times aren't good because you don't get the money you need. And no one ever gives the money back on the good side, but they always want more on the bad side. So that's why entitlement programs are inherently bad. That's an observation. But I know we're not going to talk about today, Mr. Mayor, but I do know I've asked a lot of questions about the $100 million in unencumbered fair act per year memo, which I've seen. That $100 million, where that is and where that could that be used, but I have to, and how much, if you get all the vacancies like we do, you have a lot of under execution. So I suspect we should be looking how to use that one time under execution. It's one time money, but maybe that starts you on your one time correction of your compensation issues and gives us more breathing space to find the out year money to make it work. But 
I think you got to start using the money that you're under executing should show up here and here somewhere on how you're using that to solve the problem you said is most important. If it's compensation, if it's wages, if it's training, then I think that's maybe you might want to think about where to put that money because, uh, and I know we'll have that discussion on the reversion funds, $54.9 million plus $100 million in unencumbered CARES Act money means you have, you're not counting under execution this year, you're sitting on a hundred, potentially a $154.9 million asset. And clearly, it would be hard for someone who's looking at their books to claim how bad off they were when they have that kind of discretionary money potentially at their disposal. So I look forward to that discussion coming forward, Mr. Mayor, more than the five-year forecast. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I I'm glad you uh, brought up the student population because I think that that's something that we have to be very um, aware of. Um, 2021, we lost a significant population of students and that continued losing more. 2021-22 um, school year, I believe we're down by about 3,000 students. Um, and last year, the state gave us that money through the new loss funding, but we can't rely on that this year. Um, with using the 3,000 loss number, approximately how much money is that in state funding since um, some of our funding is based upon membership? So the 3,000 student loss was at the end of 21. Um, so in 22, we're not down, we're down in the hundreds, not in the thousands. So we did run through all the calculations um, without the no loss funding. And because it's a, it impacts basic aid and then sales tax gets involved and you have an adverse relationship between the basic aid formula and that, you don't see the significant reductions that you thought you would see. But if the no loss funding remains or the state that has it in their baseline for rebenchmarking purposes distributes that to localities that have lost those, those, those students and have not been returned, then we just don't know the answers to that yet. Okay, so, but we are down 3,000 from year before last, and so that is a total loss of 3,000. Right. So that would be included in, in the mm -hmm. loss of funding. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Anyone else at this point? Yes, Beth. So um, just to address what Mr. Moss said about not utilizing our full budget, um, Ms. Pate, would you please uh, explain uh, how much of that that we actually did not utilize. And, and the reason for that, I do believe that it's been about maybe 20 years ago that the school board overspent. And I do, be do mm. believe that's against the law to overspend our budget. So we cut it very, very close for a reason. And Ms. Pate, would you? Uh, reiterate on that, please. So related to this last fiscal year close, if we only looked at what was appropriated um, in the initial budget development process, we would have reverted about $14.1 million, which is about less than 2%, it's about 1.5% of our operating budget. We did have excess budget um, over revenue for areas that we would not be able to estimate at the time, but that came in, um, I believe federal impact aid came in over and also sales tax came in over and then we did lose in other revenue sources and um, in state revenue, we did lose some money. So that ended up being 10.1 million on top of the 14.1 and I don't have my numbers in front of me. The remaining amount of that $54.9 million relates to the revenue sharing formula and the amount that came through that calculation. Um, certainly, I think based on, and I'm sure Kevin could speak to this better, I'm sure that based on the projections made at the time and then what actually occurred, that showed that those city revenue streams came in much higher than what was anticipated and that we followed that revenue sharing formula, that was the remainder of the 54.9. But if you just to look at the, the amount that was appropriated straight off the front with no um, revenue variances and no revenue sharing formula, we were down pretty close to our operating budget. Okay, thank you. Yes. And Ms. Pay, could you just share briefly the CARES funding sure. component? Thank you. <clears throat> So right now we do currently have a little over $100 million. That funding lasts over two and three year periods. Um, we have to file applications and amendments to those applications have to be approved for any additional spending priorities can change. As we've mentioned, we, have, we filed an application with many uh, HVAC projects, air purifiers, all kinds of things like that initially. As we continue to have these discussions on compensation, I don't think any of us foreseen the types of things we're experiencing now in workforce challenges. I just, I think we started to see it, thought it would level out, the school got started, it didn't. 
Um, we are having those discussions now, or in the final stages of those discussions. We have plans that have not been shared yet with our school board um, that senior staff is working on. Um, so we can change the priority of those CARES money. And that is what we are strategically trying to do. And we do have some time to amend those applications and get them approved and become able to spend that money within the time period allocated. Okay, thank you. For, uh, John, if you can. Wanna, be, that's yeah. why I have asked the council to defer any action on the $54.9 million reversion request until we have a holistic, better understanding of the $107 million that you have on hand and how that might open up some opportunities for us to expand our tax base with some of that money that benefits both the school and the city in the long run. Okay, thank you. Folks, i tell you what, we're pretty much on time and I just wanna thank everybody. Uh, I thank all the presenters for you know what they did today. It was really meaningful information. And uh, I think it may be prudent that once things crystallize a little bit more early next year that we reconvene together. Thank you. We are adjourned.